So welcome to the Bipartisan Policy Center for our third annual Legislative Action Awards. As I think most of you know, the Bipartisan Policy Center prides itself on actually being in the arena, providing substantive input and some strategic support to the folks who are trying to do the hard work of governing a divided country. We've come to realize that um, the vast majority of members of Congress are really good people with pretty bad incentives. And at the same time, there are some who have the courage and the creativity to advance sound public policy, to build some vital coalitions, and actually get results, despite the headwinds that are affecting the institution. So each year, we like to present our Legislative Action Awards to acknowledge some of the leaders who are making the democracy actually work for the people. In addition to, of course, acknowledging some individual achievement, the awards are also intended to speak to the ongoing vitality of the institution of Congress. There is a long-standing, very proud, bicameral, bipartisan tradition of disparaging our nation's legislative body. Um, one of our nation's founders, John Adams, stated that, I have accepted a seat in the House of Representatives and therefore consented to my own ruin. <laughs> one of the Bipartisan Policy Center founders, Bob Dole, said, if you're hanging around with nothing to do and the zoo is closed, come to the Senate. You'll get the same kind of feeling and you won't have to pay. <laughs> Someone obviously has to tell Senator Dole that the Smithsonian institutions are free to the public, but you get the, <laughs> you get the basic point. Um, well, the capacity for self-ridicule is, of course, really one of the fundamental essences of a free society. Low expectations can also be somewhat self-fulfilling. And so one of the aspirations of the Legislative Action Award is to make the case that, you know, the process is banged up, but it's certainly not broken. And we at the BPC do what we can to try to provide some support to strengthen the incentives for the people who really want to get things done. I just want to mention one example, because we're quite proud of it, and that is our American Congressional Exchange, where representatives from opposing parties are traveling to each other's districts and spending weekends together to try to actually understand what are the local interests that motivate their representation. Um, we've done, I think, nine of these trips. We have 20 more planned for the year. And they're really fun. And if the American people could actually see the commitment to national service and the camaraderie and the knowledge that are displayed on these weekends, I think the congressional approval rate would skyrocket, probably double to almost 40%. It's the latest Gallup poll. Um, but what is really gratifying for us is when the members come back and actually start to introduce amendments and really do the work together that is the engine of the democracy. So let me um, close by simply announcing the recipients of the 2019 BPC Legislative Achievement Awards, and then we will have some remarks. And they are Senators Tammy Baldwin, Shelley Moore Capito, and Representatives Doug Collins, Hakeem Jeffries, John Katko, and Derek Kilmer. In a moment or two, you will hear more about these individuals and their achievements from our presenters, BPC Board Chair Robbie Bach and BPC Action Board Chair Kim Dorgan. But just suffice to say that all of our recipients have demonstrated that the U.S. Congress is, in fact, still a deliberative body that is capable of having evidence-based substantive debate, constructive disagreements, individual thought, and actually, from time to time, principled resolution. And so it is in that spirit that we are delighted to honor their achievements, and I am delighted to ask Kim Dorgan to come present the first award. Thank you, Jason, and thank you all for coming. So for the first time since we established the Legislative Action Award, we're acknowledging a specific pair of members of Congress uh, who work together to effect major change and enact landmark legislation for the entire nation. And you know, we all hear, especially all of us in Washington, where we hear Congress is not going to do anything, they're just going to have more noise. I think these two gentlemen, Congressman Collins and Congressman Jeffries, have made it uh, a, a huge example for the rest of the Congress, from the country, that when you really put your mind to it, you can accomplish big things. And really, uh, congratulations to you both again for that huge success. One of the things we recognize and indeed celebrate at the BPC is proud and stalwart Republicans 
and Democrats who are nonetheless willing to transcend party in circumstances that speak to the greater good of the country. Certainly, we have a shining example of this ideal with Congressman Doug Collins and Hakeem Jeffries, who last Congress shepherded historic criminal justice reform into enactment. Congressman Jeffries is unable to join us tonight due to a previous commitment, but we are very honored to have Congressman Collins be able to join us. Doug Collins has represented Georgia's 9th Congressional District since 2013 and is currently the ranking member of the House Judiciary Committee. As a senior member of that committee in the previous Congress, he helped to forge a remarkable achievement, the successful enactment of the First Step Act, which has been called the most substantial criminal justice reform legislation in a generation. He, along with his Democratic colleague, was instrumental in building an extraordinary coalition of House members and groups across the political spectrum to provide the necessary support to create momentum and ultimately success in sending the, the legislation over the finish line. In the end, more than 70 different organizations fought for this bill, from the ACLU to the Fraternal Order of Police to the American Conservative Union. This would have been an incredible accomplishment unto itself, but the fact that this legislation passed by an overwhelming vote of 358 to 36 in the House and 87 to 12 in the Senate speaks volumes about the level of dedication and the tireless pursuit that Congressman Collins committed to the issue. Those kind of vote margins in this current polarized environment are almost unheard of on such a major piece of legislation and they represent an exceptional bipartisan legislative journey deserving of admiration and emulation. As a result, the new law contains meaningful reforms that reduce certain mandatory minimum sentences, expands on good time credits based on prisoner behavior, enhances job training and other programs for prisoners to help reduce recidivism, and includes other targeted reforms that will increase public safety. As Congressman Collins has stated, the First Step Act invests in what Americans value most fiercely, people. We know that lives can be redirected and redeemed, and we're committing to doing just that with tools that are proven to work. We have the opportunity to make communities safer and more whole through the First Step Act, and we wouldn't have had that without the courage of my friend and valuable partner, Hakeem Jeffries. This bill shows us that reverence for human life is fundamental to justice. Congressman Collins, the Bipartisan Policy Center, is most honored to present you with this uh, 2019 Legislative Action Award. Please come to the podium. Wow. That's impressive. Thank you so much. Um, it is sort of interesting, you talked about uh, the quote from John Adams, and I'll, I, I don't know, in my lifetime I have started out, I was a salesman, I've been a pastor, a Southern Baptist pastor, I'm an Air Force chaplain, I went to law school, I'm a member of Congress, at some point I'm going to break the 15 to 20 percent popularity threshold. <laughs> This is a special award for me because it really goes back to what I believe that Congress is about. I came to Congress after serving in the state legislature because I believe that the, really the fundamental thing about Washington, D.C. that is broken is that legislators have forgotten that their primary job is legislating. In fact, we've often forgotten how to do it. Our muscle memory is so strained that all we know now is our, many times, the partisan talking points that we have and getting reelected in our district. My staff has always known that if there's a choice between doing what is right and trying to pass big legislation or being defeated in the next election and getting to spend the rest of my life with my beautiful bride, I will choose to do what is right and go home to be with my bride. <laughs> this is an exciting time, though, because Hakeem Jeffries and I are close like brothers, and we have fought many fights. The First Step Act was one in which, I, as I told the President of the United States in the Oval Office, this, sir, is a bill that you're signing that has faces behind the lines. And we saw that in the State of the Union with Matthew Charles when he was there after being set free after serving his time now to be reunited with his family. But this is not the first time Hakeem and I have done this. Eighty more coalition on the First Step Act. Two months earlier, the Music Modernization Act rewrote the entire copyright code for probably another first time in a generation. And yes, it was Hakeem and myself. 
Going back to last year, the Cloud Act, which was inserted into the spending bill from last year, which dealt with data privacy all over the, not only our country, but in how we interact with other countries, was also another product of Doug Collins and Hakeem Jeffries. I'm now, and Hakeem and I have talked about this, as he says he is from the Republic of Brooklyn in New York, and I'm a conservative from North Georgia, the son of a Georgia State Trooper. But at the end of the day, if we can come together and bring broad coalitions together to say this is why we should be here legislating as the founders intended, the first thing that we would say is, is we have a friendship that transcends the partisan bickering, but we have a staff on both sides that are amazing because we simply stand on the shoulders many times of the hard work that they do, and I'll never forget the hard work that they provide, and Sally Rose Larson is here with me tonight on that. So as we go forward, I encourage you, keep incentivizing hard work. Keep incentivizing actual accomplishments. And start incentivizing the biggest thing in this town, and that is what's called a red line. That is actually a bill passed into law. And with that, thank you so much. I want to thank the congressman. In the spirit of um, this being the Legislative Action Award, a lot of our recipients are actually involved in legislative action at the very moment. And so we're going to have some folks coming in and out. Um, that means that you should have really robust, intimate conversations that you're ready to stop on a moment's notice when you uh, hear the little sound of the, let's hear from a congressman. Um, so please enjoy the evening. I also was just delighted to see uh, our favorite new freshman member of Congress, a returning member to DPC, Donna Shalala, who has served <laughs> proudly on a number of our projects and uh, delighted to bring a little experience to town, uh, Secretary. So enjoy the evening. And again, we'll be interrupting you a couple of times over the next hour to have some other awardees take the stage. Thank you very much. Uh, we're, we're back with our second presentation this evening. My name is Robbie Bach. I'm the chair of the board of the Bipartisan Policy Center. And I have the pleasure of introducing someone from my home state who I've gotten to know pretty well and who I think uh, serves the state of Washington incredibly well. Our next awardee is Representative Derek Kilmer of Washington. And he truly personifies the spirit of BPC's Legislative Action Award. Congressman Kilmer has represented Washington's 6th District since 2013. Previously, he worked for a decade for the Economic Development Board for Tacoma, Pierce County, and served in the Washington State Legislature for eight years. In the House, he chairs the New Democrats Coalition, otherwise known as the New Dems. They're very creative with these naming things. Uh, which is a centrist coalition of Democrats in the House. The Luger Center Bipartisan Index reports that he is 34th most bipartisan member of the entire House of Representatives. Congressman Kilmer has championed bipartisan efforts to, bring, um, to better leverage federal research dollars, to, pro, uh, to spur private sector innovation and job growth, and bolster a 21st century workforce. And I will tell you, coming from the state of Washington and his district, that is much needed and very valuable. He is also pushing for a bipartisan solution to solve the problems for ocean acidification, he joined with Republican Representative Jamie Herrera Butler, also from Washington, to reintroduce bipartisan legislation that will allow federal agencies to use existing funds to design prize competitions, competitions that will bolster the ability to manage, monitor, and research ocean acidification and its impacts. The legislation was created in collaboration with a range of key stakeholders. In 2018, Representative Kilmer was named to serve on the Bipartisan Joint Select Committee on Budget and Appropriations Process Reform, which was created to propose long-term changes to Congress's budgeting process. As my friend uh, Derek Kilmer himself has said, I've long said Congress is a fixer-upper. And in recognition of his seriousness of purpose this year, he was appointed co-chair of the Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress which BPC strongly supports and is tasked with making recommendations for improving the institution. In fact, Congressman Kilmer was here just last week at a public event to speak to those very issues. And I will just add that uh, in talking with Jason earlier, he reported that uh, Congressman Kilmer is now the energizer bunny of bipartisan work on the Hill. So we're excited to, uh, to have that. Finally, Representative Kilmer has participated in BPC's American Congressional Exchange Program, which Jason mentioned earlier 
where members from across the aisle pair up to travel to one another's districts to learn more about what motivates each other and build bonds of bipartisan trust. And I will say that I participated a little bit in that visit to Seattle, and the exchange between Arkansas and Washington was, uh, was wonderful to see. He is what a legislator should be. We couldn't be more honored to present him with our 2019 Legislative Action Award. Let's show our thanks and appreciation to Congressman Derek Kilmer. That's so nice. Thank you, Robbie um, and uh, Jason. I, um, I am indeed a uh, BPC groupie. Um, I'd like to thank Jason for not putting a restraining order out against me and my staff for the amount of time we reach out. Indeed, 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 indeed we are. Um, so uh, it, it's interesting. I, um, there's a whole bunch of things I could talk about, um, but I thought I would uh, just speak briefly about a few things that. Um, make me hopeful. The, uh, I used to call myself an optimist, and then my pastor gave me this thing that was written by a rabbi in England, and it said, uh, uh, optimism is a passive virtue. Uh, it's the belief that things will just get better. Uh, hope is an active virtue. It's the belief that together we can make things better. And I was like, well, I kind of like that. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop calling myself optimistic. I'm going to start calling myself hopeful. But there's a number of things that give me hope. Um, certainly the New Dems, as Robbie mentioned, uh, give me hope. We're 101 members. We're now the, actually the largest uh, um, ideological coalition among the House Democrats. And there are some amazing new members who, are come, who came here to, um, to get stuff done, who want to actually make a positive difference on behalf of the American people. That gives me hope. Uh, I get hope from, I, um, and BPC has come and participated in this. I uh, co-chair a group called the um, a Bipartisan Working Group, which is a dozen Democrats and a dozen Republicans who meet for breakfast every week. And it's kind of a meeting in three parts. The first part of the meeting, anybody who's working on something that wants to invite collaboration or co-sponsorship gets a chance to make a pitch. And then the second part of the meeting, we talk about what's going on in Congress that week. And, you know, those can be feisty conversations if you're talking about health care or immigration or taxes or whatever. You know, people can have sharp elbows, but I'm increasingly of the belief that good democracy is a little bit like a good marriage, right? You don't necessarily have to agree with each other and everything, but we got to be able to talk to each other and listen to each other and not have everything turn into the Jerry Springer show. Um, and then the third part of the meeting, we talk about big, hairy issues facing the country, and we often invite outside speakers, including um, uh, we've had, um, I'm going to get the BPC a punch card. Uh, like every fifth visit, free latte. Um, but, uh, you know, and I don't want to mislead you into thinking we're holding hands around the table and singing kumbaya or closing our eyes and doing trust falls into each other's arms. Um, we stopped doing that after we dropped a guy. But um, I will tell you, it's sort of the hour of each week where I find myself thinking, oh, we got to do more of that, not just in this Congress, but in this country. And then finally, um, I'm very hopeful about the new Select Committee on the Modernization of Congress. About every 20 or 30 years or so, Congress recognizes that it needs to do better, um, that it's not exactly a high-performing vehicle. And, uh, and the downside of that is the American people feel it. I represent a district that is not Seattle. Um, it's not enjoying the economic recovery that, um, you know, Seattle's booming. Seattle's got a growth problem. It's booming so much, manifested by traffic problems and housing unaffordability. Most of my district has a jobs problem um, where we have communities, where a lot of the communities were once prosperous and now um, there's a real fear that the main industry will become opioids and the main export will be young people. And we don't accept that. And, um, and it needs a functional Congress to, make, to have government work uh, for them, to create more economic opportunity for more people in more places. And uh, I was very hopeful. I was very excited about we had the first meeting of the Select Committee yesterday. We had 30 men, 31 members of Congress come and testify about their ideas for making Congress function better. We heard everything from ways to try to recruit, retain, and have a more diverse staff in Congress to ideas to onboard technological innovation in a way that does a better job of solving problems for the American people. Um, to looking at rules reforms that would make the process more transparent and more bipartisan. So I walked away from that saying, gosh, we actually have a fair amount in common, and shame on us if we can't get something done at the end of this year. So um, I am very grateful to the BPC, not just for the recognition, but primarily for their partnership, for their thought partnership, um, 
and we're going to be working a lot, I think, together uh, over the next year in the work of the Select Committee. And I'm just very grateful for every one of you who's here, um, both to support that effort and to support the BPC. So thanks for that. Congratulations once again, Congressman. Our next legislative action awardee this evening has never hesitated much crossing the political aisle to forge real results for the people of West Virginia and America. And while she regrets she's not able to be here tonight due to a previous commitment, we are pleased that she sent us a video. Senator Shelley Moore Capito. Senator Capito continues to serve as a model lawmaker and a credit to the institution of the Senate. She has been a senator from West Virginia since 2015, after seven terms in the U.S. House of Representatives. She is also the first Republican woman elected to Congress from West Virginia and the first woman elected to the U.S. Senate in the history of West Virginia. And, and God bless you. <laughs> um, the Luger Center Bipartisanship Index and the New York Times has ranked her amongst the most moderate Republicans in the Senate and amongst the most Republican senators. Senator Capito teamed up with Democratic Senator Gary Peters to introduce legislation that will help expand access to opioid addiction treatment for adolescents. She joined with Peters again on bipartisan legislation to help private student loan borrowers rehabilitate their credit after a default on their loans. She also worked with her colleague and fellow Legislative Action awardee, Senator Baldwin, on opioid prescription reform at the VA, as well as on trade issues with China. She also introduced legislation with Democrats Jean Shaheen and Maggie Hassan to prioritize federal funding for states hardest hit by the opioid epidemic. In an entirely different arena, Senator Capito crossed across the aisle, worked across the aisle to introduce a measure to provide funding for rural broadband projects in her high-need areas, and in yet another critical area, she was successful in incorporating four key provisions into an energy bill that updated America's energy policy for the first time in eight years, including measures to improve the pipeline permitting process and to boost caption carbon, to capture, I'm sorry, to boost carbon capture and storage technologies. These are but a few examples of her effectiveness, and we're proud to recognize Senator Shelley Moore Capito with our 2019 Legislative Action Award. And now let's hear from the Senator herself. Hello, everyone. I'm sorry I couldn't be with you tonight, but thank you so much for this honor. It's a little surreal to receive a re an award for doing what we're supposed to be doing here in Congress, but I really do take pride in working across the aisle to find common ground on issues that matter to those who I have the privilege to represent. A prime example of extraordinary bipartisanship is the Support for Patients and Communities Act, the comprehensive opioid crisis response legislation that became law last year. This bill was incredibly important to me, being from West Virginia, one of the states that's hardest hit by the opioid epidemic. More than 70 senators contributed to this sweeping bill, Republicans and Democrats alike. I'm so proud of the legislation we produced, and that's largely due to the fact that we work together across the aisle to achieve a common goal. Another bipartisan issue I'm very passionate about is rural broadband. For far too long, rural communities have been left behind when it comes to reliable, high-speed internet. And that's creating a digital divide that is detrimental to business, schools, healthcare, and more. That's why I'm proud to be the co-chair of the Senate Broadband Caucus, the bipartisan Senate Broadband Caucus, to raise awareness and deliver solutions related to this issue. In closing, I'll just say there really is more bipartisan work happening on Capitol Hill than they like to show on TV. It may not be on particularly flashy issues, but they're issues that matter. Anything is possible when you have an open mind and a willingness to find common ground. So again, thank you for this recognition, and thank you for all that you do to encourage bipartisan policy and conversation. Have a great evening.
That video was perfectly timed because our next uh, award winner is here. So let me, this is the problem as I've aged, I need glasses to actually read these things. Hang on a second. Okay, our next representative and, and, and award winner is John Katko. When the Bipartisan Policy Center conceived of the Legislative Action Award, we didn't know it at the time, but we were envisioning someone exactly like Representative Katko. He was, the first, he was first elected to represent uh, his upstate New York district in 2014, following a 20-year career as a federal prosecutor. In considering our nominations this year, we were exceptionally impressed with Congressman Katko's independence and effectiveness, which have followed him to ser allowed him to serve in the House of Representatives so well and so effectively. In fact, Representative Katko has a Luger Center bipartisanship ranking of seven out of the entire House of Representatives. Moreover, the Center for Effective Lawmaking rates him extremely high on their legislative effectiveness index and finds that he is above expectations for effectiveness. As a freshman from 2015 to 2016, Congressman Katko advanced the second most bills out of committee amongst all House freshmen. One of them that was signed into law by President Obama and co-sponsored by Democrats included security measures for airports that were incorporated into a federal aviation bill. Representative Katko reached across the aisle on two bipartisan measures to combat human trafficking. He, was also, he also co-chaired the Problem Solvers Caucus Infrastructure Task Force and introduced legislation based on infrastructure recommendations made by the Bipartisan Policy Center. The congressman teamed up with Democratic Representative Don Beyer to form a new bipartisan House Suicide Prevention Task Force concurrent with the 42nd Annual National Suicide Prevention Week. Along with Democrat Tom Swozy, and if Tom, if I pronounced your name wrong, I apologize, Katko introduced bipartisan legislation geared towards reducing opioid addiction and drug abuse nationwide by placing limits on opioid prescriptions. On a different note, legislation authored by Congressman Katko to reauthorize the Brownfields program passed the House of Representatives with broad bipartisan support and was included in the Comprehensive Brownfields Reauthorization Act of 2017. These and many other efforts demonstrate why we need more like Representative Katko in the United States Congress. His approach to legislating is truly a model to be emulated, so would you please join me in congratulating another of our 2019 Legislative Action Award winners, Congressman John Katko. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Let's take a picture over here. That's very nice. Thank you. Thank you very much. Well, I, I just ate two pieces of cake, so I got a sugar buzz going, so it might take a while for me to get off here. So um, thank you very much. And uh, this is very, very nice. And it is, but, but more importantly, it's what it represents is important to all of us in Washington. I, I'm not going to tell you something you don't already know, but the far left and the far right have hijacked this process with legislating. And it's become a zero-sum game where, whereby unless, for the vast majority of people on both sides, unless you're 100% with them on something, they're not going to support it. And that's not what Congress is not about, all about. It's not what our government is all about. In fact, when they founded this country, they had a problem. The big states like Virginia wanted what? A House of Representatives type government because they had all the population. The little states like Rhode Island said, oh, hang on. That's not going to work for us. So instead of saying, to hell with you guys, we're not going to form a country, they did get compromised. And they, they had a House and a Senate, and that's how it was born. Those fundamental principles of compromise are lost nowadays. And so, but what you're doing here by recognizing bipartisanship, it's critically important. No doubt we have a long way to go. There's no doubt. But when you look at where we are now and where we can be, uh, we have no choice but to get there. And you need to recognize people more with things like this and, and uh, champion that because it's tough. I mean, when I sign on to Republican, le Democratic legislation rather, I, there's a certain group of me back home that's going to just kick the crap out of me, and it's merciless. But I've gotten to the point where if I know if the far left is pissed at me and the far right's pissed at me, I'm doing a really good job, and that's where I am right now. And, I, and I'm okay with that, but you've got to be able to get past this zero-sum game. And I, <clears throat> excuse me, I have a cold. I look back to the 1980s of Ronald Reagan and Tip O'Neill. Ronald Reagan was a hardcore conservative who was going to ruin the world when he got into office. So what did he do? He developed a relationship with the Speaker of the House, Tip O'Neill, a flaming liberal from Massachusetts who controlled the House. People forget 
What Reagan accomplished legislatively was done primarily with a, uh, uh, a Democratic House. You know, to immigration reform, social security reform, tax reform, and tax cuts. And Ronald Reagan would always say, I'll take what I get now and keep working on the rest. That's not a zero-sum attitude. And I dare say that if Ronald Reagan were working today in the House, that he would be considered a moderate like me. And that's we, how far we've gone to the extreme. And we've got to get past there. So I had a 20-year career as a federal prosecutor, which I loved, an organized crime prosecutor. Um, and I earned every gray hair with the death threats and everything else because I had a lot of death penalty cases. <clears throat> but it was very easy there sometimes because I was a good guy getting bad guys. But I wanted to sacrifice my country and my family and come to Washington to try and propound this bipartisanship message because I saw how far askew it got. And I never didn't realize how bad it was till I got here. But I just set out to, uh, to be determined. So there's a couple things I do with everything I do. I will not introduce a bill unless I have a de Democratic co-sponsor. So no messaging bills for me. I will not introduce a bill unless I have a Democratic co-sponsor. So what does that mean? Sometimes I give them a bill, and they'd look at me and say, um, and I don't like this or that provision, and they, so I can't co-sponsor. I'm like, okay, fine. Let's fix it. How do you like it now? And they say, my God, yeah, okay, I'll sign on. And they do this, I do the same with their bills. And because of that, I had, I've had 34 bills in a little, less than four, little over four years 34 bills passed the House and 20 signed into law. 10 by President Obama and 10 by President Trump. <laughs> right? Thank you. And um, the remarkable thing about that is I'm the number one target for the Democratic Party because I have the worst district from Republican to hold. So even against that, the fact that Obama would sign 10 of my bills into law and the Democrats would, would work with me shows that bipartisanship can work and you can break through it. And what you're doing, it's really important. You've got to push it harder. And anything I can do to be a champion for you, I will. I'm trying to lead by example. And the other ones you recognize here, I congratulate them because they have the guts to do it. It's not easy going against your party. And it's not easy going against your colleagues. But sometimes it's the right thing to do. And today's another example. We signed on as one of only two co-sponsors for, the, for the, um, one of the top bills that the Democrats have. It's the right thing to do about LGBTQ rights, right? And so we signed on to it. And you know what? If people don't like that, well, tough noogies, as my law school friends used to say. <laughs> and, but the bottom line is civility, bipartisanship, is where we got to get back to. And, we, and I dare say until we get someone in the White House who was a Democrat or Republican who doesn't just cater to his own party and recognizes that it's much bigger than that, we're going to struggle. But we need to set the example in Congress, and uh, we're trying hard to do that. Um, it's very tough. It's tough sledding. Trust me, it's not easy. But you got to have the respect of your colleagues to do it, and I'm trying to do that. So I thank you very much for this. This is very cool. My wife might think I'm worth a shit now if I get to show her this thing. <laughs> but uh, um, uh, anything I can do to help you moving forward, I will, because this is my passion. This is why I, this is why I came to Congress. This is why I gave up a career I loved, because things like this, because we have to, uh, we have to chart a new course in this country, and it starts right here. So thank you guys very much. I appreciate it. I'm back again. Um, uh, it is truly a pleasure to introduce our final winner this evening. Um, she is an outstanding United States Senator and exemplary lawmaker. Of course, I'm speaking about Democratic Senator from Wisconsin, Tammy Baldwin. Senator Baldwin was first elected in 2012 after serving seven terms in the U.S. House of Representatives. In analysis of 2017 legislation, she co-sponsored the fifth most bills compared to all senators. And of those 319 bills, nearly one-third were introduced by a senator who was not a Democrat. Senator Baldwin exemplifies how lawmakers can be proud, productive, and pragmatic partisans. She has forged solutions on major issues from America's opioid crisis to vital assistance for family caregivers and bolstering access to maternity health care. In tandem with Republican Senator Lisa Murkowski, Senator Baldwin introduced the bipartisan Improving Access to Maternity Care Act, which was signed into law to address critical maternity care shortages in underserved areas. And she worked with Republican Susan Collins on the RAISE Family Caregivers Act, which requires the federal government to devise a strategy to support 
unpaid family caregivers nationwide. When it comes to the scourge of addiction afflicting our country, Senator Baldwin authored a measure with Republican Bill Cassidy of Louisiana, which was included in the Opioid Re Crisis Response Act of 2018, which became law to help stop the flow of illegal opioids and other illicit drugs into the country through international mail. That law also includes provisions Senator Baldwin wrote to expand and extend an important grant program to provide states and tribal communities additional resources for local prevention, treatment, and recovery efforts. Senator Baldwin has worked to pass bills with other Republicans, including the late Senator John McCain, Senator Marco Rubio, and one of our other awardees tonight, Senator Shelley Moore Capito, working to strengthen oversight of the VA's opioid prescribing practices and providing safer care for our veterans. In 2018, the Shepherd Express of Milwaukee declared that she is amongst uh, the most progressive Democratic senators, yet she's also established a reputation for bipartisanship because she frequently works with Republicans to get things done. In that spirit, and since I grew up in Wisconsin, I'm very proud to announce and to represent Senator Baldwin, the Bipartisan Policy Center is honored to present you with our 2019 Legislative Action Award. Yeah. Come on over here, we'll take a little picture. Has uh, Senator Capito been able to... She, she, we had a video from the Senator. Okay. As I was... Um, uh, I, I'll say a couple of words about, uh, about her, too. Um, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction and that this... Um, it's a real honor to be recognized in this way. Um, and, and we need to uh, recognize and call out uh, bipartisan cooperation. And as you were telling uh, a little bit about my collaboration with um, uh, Senator Shelley Moore Capito, uh, you know, we served together in the House. We had offices that were uh, adjacent to one another, often walked to the votes together. And um, I think that's one of the things that people uh, lament that there's not as much time for. Uh, in uh, uh, with busy schedules and the expectation that all members of both houses go home every weekend and uh, keep their uh, their base there, um, but Americans really do expect their government leaders to work to address the real challenges uh, and problems that they face, and getting things done requires uh, a desire to work together across the party line or other lines uh, to uh, form solutions. And it means moving past what divides us and finding common ground. While the media focuses on partisan conflict, uh, there are many on Capitol Hill who are working together to solve problems. Um, while much of the bipartisan work really does go unnoticed or at least unreported by uh, cable TV talkers, um, it is what people would like to see from Washington. And uh, sometimes I'm at home and I'm talking about some of those efforts and people are kind of incredulous that that sort of thing actually does go on. Um, it, so this recognition really does help to shine a light on the fact that in many ways government can work to make a real difference in people's lives. Um, in my outreach to my colleagues, um, I almost always have found a receptive ear to at least look for opportunities to work across the partisan divide. Um, and I have to mention as an aside, um, I got my start in this uh, early uh, when I was in the state assembly in Wisconsin, um, it became, I don't know how to phrase it, but sort of like a challenge I gave to myself, I'm going to find an issue I can work on with uh, the most conservative Republicans in the state legislature. And then I would try to get to know them better and figure out what uh, what issue we had in common, what issues and concerns we would work on together. And my goal was to get the reaction when the bill came up and they called it, you know, the Baldwin-Walker bill. 
and by Walker I'm referring to our former Republican Governor Scott Walker, but there was indeed a Baldwin-Walker bill that was signed into law by Governor Tommy Thompson, that um, I wanted to get the reaction of, well, if these two can agree on something, we've got to all be for it. <laughs> and uh, uh, now, um, I, that's not necessarily the first goal I start with, but it is something that I think gives people confidence that um, there's been compromise, there's been negotiation, and that we're heading in the right policy direction. Um, certainly in a body like the Senate, which requires a supermajority for substantive legislation to advance, we need bipartisan support if you want to get something done. And um, whether it's working, as um, you said in that gracious introduction, uh, to support family caregivers, an issue we can all um, appreciate uh, across party aisle, uh, across the party aisle, or closing the skills gap in our workforce, delivering broadband to rural America, or bringing down the cost of prescription drugs. Um, there are many, many policy challenges where we can come together to produce results for the American people. Um, I. I'm going to continue uh, to look for bipartisan uh, opportunities and cooperation. And I want to really appreciate all of you in attendance here tonight for supporting the Bipartisan Policy Center and for supporting um, and shining a light on these sort of efforts. Thank you. Thanks all for coming. <laughs> no, really, a lovely night, and it really is important to us to remind ourselves as much as anybody else that there are really good people trying to do really good things in our democracy, and your support for that, I think, means a lot to everybody, certainly to me. Thank you.